Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon this week. If uh, you wanna support what we're doing as a ministry, this is villagechurch.com slash give is the best way to do that. We are so thankful for anything that you give. Uh, obviously it costs money to be able to reach the people that we're trying to reach and resource people and do church planting and all the ministries that we do. Uh, so thank you so much. Also, we don't want you to just watch. We want you to get involved. So this is villagechurch.com slash give groups is where you can join a community group. Doesn't matter where you are, a Zoom call or physical uh, in Canada. Now we're starting to open up. So that's going to be something that's an option. But no matter where you are, uh, you can get in a group and we'll actually organize it and manage uh, for you to get in groups wherever you happen to be. So, so thankful that you're watching this. Hopefully you enjoy this sermon. I think it's a bit of a spicy one. Let's go. Hey, Village Church, Pastor Mark here. So glad you're with us. If you are in Calgary, you are live in the theater. Man, good to have you. All our other sites next week, we are going live, uh, except the Surrey site, but you guys are still online. And of course, all our online audience from around the world. We are Jack D. You are here. We are in the Gospel of John, chapter five. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever become something you said to yourself, I'm never going to become that? Like, you know, you looked at your parents, you're like, I'm never gonna be like that. And then you looked in the mirror one day, you're like, I'm exactly exactly like that now. What is my deal? I have never been a guy who loves the dogs and the pets and the different animals. I just wasn't, sorry, I slipped in a bit of Cosby there. Uh, so I was never that guy. And this past week, uh, a couple weeks ago in BC, there was uh, like this crazy heat wave. Don't know if you heard of it. Highest temperatures in the history of BC, whatever. And we don't have air conditioning. So I was like, I was dying. My parents-in-law, my in-laws were visiting. They're like, you know, old. And I didn't want them to die. But then, and then I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? And then my dog, my kids were like hovering on my dog. And my dog can't even breathe. And it's like, oh my goodness. And so I had to take my hard-earned money and get a hotel room for the night because it was air conditioned. Never did I, no, it was like, oh, the in-laws are going to die. like, <laughs> but then the dog was going to die. It's like, okay, this is a for sure thing. Now we got to go get a hotel. I just never saw myself as that guy. But now I'm that guy. I just love my dog. And I'm like, I'm a dog guy now. And I get it. Uh, this story we're about to go through and the stuff we're going to extrapolate out from it from the be to the best of our ability, it's going to be it's going to be people who there was an idea and I'm sure they said to themselves, we're never going to become those people. And they became those people and Jesus scandalizes them. And I think for some of you, this is going to be an important day because he's going to scandalize you because you become the people you never thought you'd become in two different ways. So remember last week I talked about the fact that I'm an equal opportunity offender. So sometimes I'm offending the conservatives and sometimes I'm, you know, offending the liberals. Today, if we, depending on how far we get in this text, we're going to see Jesus offends both. And isn't that awesome? Because that's what the gospel is supposed to do. It's supposed to offend all of us. The older brothers and the younger brothers of the prodigal son story are both going to be offended today. And so you got to say, which one am I? How is this story going to mess me up? So here we go. Chapter five, starting in verse eight. Verse eight says this, Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. There's this man, he's been sitting there uh, for so many years, 38 years, waiting to be healed. And uh, the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. This is going to be a problem. Here's what the Sabbath was. It was the day Shabbat. It was the day God had given Israel to rest. So he, it's back to Genesis 1. God creates the world in six days. The, the, the plants and the animals and the, the people and everything. And then the seventh day, God rests. It's not because he's tired. It's because he's trying to set up a rhythm for our lives. And he rests, he chills, and he creates this, this law by Exodus 20 as, as Israel comes out through the wilderness and he says, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to rest on this seventh day. I don't want you to work. I, don't, I want you to let the land rest. I want you to ec economically, the world can't just, you can't function in a way where you're just constantly working seven days a week, round the clock to get more money, get more stuff. You're gonna scandalize the world. You're gonna destroy yourselves. This is a beautiful principle that God gives to humankind. And the question is, do you follow this beautiful rhythm in your life at all? Is there Sabbath for you? Even today in the modern world, Orthodox Jews follow this to the letter of the law. You go to Israel, the elevators, as I've explained in past sermons, stop at every floor on the Sabbath, Friday night to Saturday night, because they don't want you to have to work and press a button is defined as working. And so it stops every floor so you don't have to do that. This is an application of the principle and the law that God lays 
focus down. I want you to rest. I want you to chill. I want you to take a breather. I want you to be focused on your family, on your faith, on just chilling out, taking a breath. Have you met people in life where they've never practiced this? This is one of the great addictions of our time is workaholism in the modern world. Workaholism is one of the addictions that actually gets credit. It gets rewarded. It gets praised. We all sit around and laugh. Oh, I work too hard. I'm so busy. And we all go, boy, I hope to hire those people. But the reality is, have you met people and they laugh about the idea that they work so hard? And there's, ah, I work, I constantly work. But then five years later, you meet them and their life is blown up, right? They've cheated, they've got some financial problem, they were already going to the strip club, you know, whatever it is. And it's like, we're all laughing at the workaholic, but we're not stopping you when there's a problem here because the soul, guys, needs to rest. If you're not resting, you've got to be able to rest because what it's going to create in your life is emotional, physical, spiritual burnout. And when you burn out, you are burnt out. You are done. And you got to understand the implication of that. My friend Kerry Newhoff wrote a book a couple of years ago called Didn't See It Coming. It's about the time where he was a pastor. He worked hard and one day he woke up and it was over, man. He couldn't get out of bed. He was having thoughts that were super not like him to have, super negative against himself. And he couldn't answer the phone, couldn't celebrate, couldn't laugh, couldn't do anything. It took him a year, do a year and a half to come back, two to three years to be functioning at 100% again. And he had to go through counseling and get forced rest. And here is God predicting this about our lives, saying, I need you guys to chill. I need you to take a day to rest and just look at the birds, man. Don't take a picture of them, Instagram them, tweet a cute little fact about them. Just go birds, all right? Just breathe it in. There's birds and they float around and, they, and that's it. The other day, my, my father-in-law looks, we're sitting in my backyard. He looks up at this tree. He's like, look at that bird. It's just sitting there on top of that thing. And I was kind of waiting for more. (laughs) Like, what's the point of this? And then that was it. He was done. (laughs) That was the point. There's a bird that sits on the branch. I'm like, "Uh uh-huh, that's true. But there's something about the simplicity of life that needs us to, to rest and take in the common graces Take in the small things. And so here we have a guy and he gets healed and it's on the Sabbath. And there's this beautiful principle where God has laid down this thing. And now here's the people who react to it. The Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Here's an idea. God gave them a great idea. This principle in the New Testament that actually continues in the New Testament in regard to rest as a principle. It's not applied... uh, as stringently as it is in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you have this concept in the book of Hebrews of rest, uh, that Jesus Christ gives us our ultimate rest if we are in him and Sabbath was a pointer to him. But there's still this principle of taking a day, setting it aside and saying, I'm gonna focus on my family, on faith, on resting, on breathing, so I can come back into the world and actually do things. This is, Jesus heals this guy And it's almost like he's working on it. Have you ever called? I remember when I was traveling in India a couple years ago, uh, I called my wife and it was like, I was up still because it was three in the morning and back here, it was like normal time. So I called her up and talking to her and the person I was, you know, sharing a room was like, buddy, it's three in the morning, go to bed. And there's this beautiful, I remember reading this, uh, I was reading a commentary on, on the gospel of John. He was saying, it's almost like Jesus is working on a different timeline. He's a time zone, a theological time zone that's different than the rest of Israel. He is coming and saying, the Sabbath was this pointer. Now I'm healing people on it. There's this new era breaking into the world and Israel's still dealing with the old timeline. They're in a theological time zone. That's like, you can't break the Sabbath. So that's why they're raising this question. They're like, why are you carrying your bed around? This actually isn't even allowed. And here they miss the beautiful principle that God laid down. They've taken a great idea and they've totally messed it up. And, they're, and, 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 and this is the thing that you and I need. We are workaholics by nature. In the West, we work super hard. And this is a principle in our life to go, you got to find a place to rest. I remember... When we started Village, I was working 80, 90 hours a week. I had three kids at home and I didn't know what this was. And it got to the brink of burnout, guys, where 
it could have gone really bad for me. Like people in burnout make mistakes, make dumb decisions that they regret for the rest of their life. It was going down that route, spiritually, emotionally, physically. I was drained. I was tired. I had three daughters at home. I wasn't the best for them. I wasn't the best for my wife. I wasn't the best for the church because I was just go, go, go all the time, constantly staying awake, emailing, always emailing, texting, writing sermons, having meetings about every strategy, every ministry, every decision came through me, which is was a setup that couldn't last. I remember... I was having uh, my, my third daughter, uh, Isabella, was almost due. And I, I, I finally got this lunch with this guy. And we went out for lunch. His name was Sam. And I sat him down. I'm like, thank goodness I finally got a lunch with you. And when we're like 100 people, you're just grinding for every person. We go out for lunch. We're sitting there having lunch. And all of a sudden, I get this phone call. And uh, it was from Erin. She's like, I think I, I'm at the house. I think I'm going into labor. And I'm like, OK, cool. This is a true story. I'm like, OK. You just chill for a bit. I got to have this lunch because this guy, like I need him to stay at the church and uh, he's going to serve and he's a great leader. And so just chill out. And she's like, uh, okay, I'm having a baby. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but, but I'm, at, I'm at lunch. Sam, so just wait. All right. And then I hung up and within 10 minutes, he's like, what was that about? I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, having a baby. He's like, yeah, I think you should probably go with that. To that. Like, I don't think I'm the priority in this moment. Go, this was my whole life. And I'm like, you know, ding. I'm like, you're right. This is a priority. And sometimes we get lost in that. And some of you are lost in that right now. And you're on the brink of something or five years down the road, you're on the brink of something. And God's point to you today is actually to rest, to actually take, right now we take family nights. We sit. Uh, recently, my wife and I were, uh, they were, we were asked to go speak over the thing. And we went and it was like two or three nights in the spot where it's it like no internet, no, like not a lot of phone, just like two or three nights of chill so that when we come back into the world, we're ready to go. We're rejuvenated, we're regenerated. We know that our, we got to invest in our marriage because one day our kids are just going to like tell us to whatever and they're going to leave and they're going to marry somebody and get it. And it's going to be her and I left to stare at each other if we don't like each other anymore. It's going to be a disaster. And that's why you need to prioritize your marriage, your, 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 whatever it is, your faith in these moments of resting and breathing. And this is why God gives it to them. And yet it's a good thing that it becomes a God thing. It's called an idol. They destroy it. They ruin the application of it. And it becomes oppressive. How many of you have come to the place in your life where an idea that is God-centered and God-given actually becomes oppressive and starts to marginalize other people, starts to demonize other people, starts to actually judge other people. And that's when it's become actually religious. And this is the first group that I want you to see Jesus is actually criticizing. He's criticizing the conservatives, the legalists. Look at verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, it's Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to take your bed. Don't you know what the Bible says? Don't you know what God says? You should pay attention to what God says. Look at verse uh, 16. It says, uh, uh, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus is doing unbelievable work and they're mad because he did it on the Sabbath. There's a good rule and it becomes abusive. This is the legalist spirit, the conservative spirit. The, if you grew up in church, you know the rules. And we talk about this often at church because constantly it's coming up through the gospels. You are the people who, who, you definitely read your Bible, you do your devos, you go to church, you tithe, you do the right things, you don't sleep around. You, you make sure that you say your prayers before bed, you read Christian books, you post Christian quotes on the internet, you attend church, and then you think, God will love you because of it. And you think it's based on, if I can do these things, then God will love me. God will protect me. God will bless me. I remember when uh, uh, the, the church uh, that, I, that, I, that I worked at at one point in my ministry, they asked me to preach one Sunday and I got up and preached. And a guy walked up to me and said, I'm pretty sure you said a lot of great biblical, theologically sound, inspiring things today, but I couldn't hear a word you said because you were wearing jeans. I was like, what? it's not like they were like ripped jeans with like, you know, all like barely holding together. I'm like, what's up, players? It was like normal jeans, but that wasn't good enough for him because at some point in his life, he came to understand a suit is what you wear and a suit is all that matters. I remember I read a story this week 
about a pastor that was preaching at his church, half, a quarter to a half of his church started grumbling through his sermon and stood up and left his church because he as a preacher was wearing a hat while he preached. Now, here's the crazy thing. By the time halfway through the sermon, uh, about halfway through the sermon, his sermon subject became very strategically about legalism. That's what he was preaching about. And the very people who needed to hear it were gone before he said it because that was the point. He was trying to say, is this what you're paying attention to? You're, you're minoring, you're majoring on the minor things. What Jesus says is you're straining out a gnat and you're swallowing a camel. You're missing the larger issues of mercy and justice and faithfulness because you're focused on these religious things that are actually destroying your soul and demonizing other people, keeping people in a place where you're like, okay, these people are the good people. These people are the bad people. I remember uh, this week there, there, was a, there was a group of construction guys just working on my backyard a little bit, doing some things. And the general contractor came and one of the guys was sitting in the back. And as he walked up, he just started like swearing his face off, just like F ball. And my, all my three daughters are sitting at the uh, breakfast table eating their cereal. And they're all like looking like this. And the general contractor, of course, knows, you know, I'm a pastor. And, you know, so he walks out there. He's like, hey, bro. And he told me that he's like telling the guy to like bring it down. The guy's going, ah, and he's like, and he's like, and he's like, I felt so bad. I look over your three daughters are like deer in the headlights. Like, I've never heard these words. Earmuffs, dad, dad, you know, whatever. And, and he's like, I can't believe this guy was talking like this. And it's like, dude, my daughters know those words because our desire is not that they uh, are in some back room, you know, totally separated from the, we're called to be salt and light to the world, in the world, but not of the world, not separated from it and just judging it from a distance saying, I can't believe people use swear words. Like, like listen, this sermon, yesterday I was working on this message and I wrote half of this sermon in a pub, all right? Because we, I had to go somewhere with air conditioning, the in-laws were around. So I went to the pub, wrote this sermon, and as I'm writing it, the guy's literally next to me. Every other word is a F, B, F, D, And I'm sitting there writing it, and I'm like, I could go over and go, guys, I'm working on something holy here. You need to be quiet. All you need to shut up because this is God's word we're talking about. I could have done that, or I could have gone, these are the guys that need Jesus. This is a point. This is what the church is called to do, not to yell and scream about, oh my goodness, look at the sinners. Yes, of course. And that's why you lean into them. I remember uh, one writer I read years ago, he, he wrote a book where he talked about the idea he was in Bible college and uh, there was a picture of Jesus on the wall and yet all the guys at the Bible college got in trouble if they grew their hair past like a certain part on their ear. And he's like, and every day we walk by a picture of Jesus with his hair down to here and we got to cut our hair up to the bowl. It's like, we're missing something here. Like when the, when the rule becomes oppressive, when you lose the spirit of the rule, then you've become so conservative and so religious that you're not able to hear what the point of the thing is to begin with. I remember I had a, a junior high youth group when I worked in Toronto, it was a lot of inner city kids. And I remember we would do these events and literally some of the kids would show up and they'd, one kid stabbed another kid on his way to youth group. Another one had a sexual assault that happened just outside. And the parents would come to me and say, I can't bring my kids to this. This is, I can't believe we're, we're and I'm like, can't believe what? That we're actually trying to reach people who might not know Jesus yet? What do you want us to do? Just sit around and, and put the kids in the back and watch Adventures and Odyssey for the next 15 years? Like, what are we talking about? This is the call. Of course, we create safe space. Of course, all of that. But it's like, we are called to be salt and light in the world. And this is literally what Jesus asks us to do. Listen to Matthew chapter nine. Jesus says this. Why do you think, uh, he, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man uh, called Matthew sitting at the tax booth and he said, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Uh, a tax collector was like the most hated person among Judaism. It was like a Nazi working at the table collecting. It was a Jew working for the Nazis. Put, that's basically what a tax collector was. Um, 
And as Jesus reclined at the table uh, in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus is hanging out with the wrong guys. He's partying with sinners. Can you believe it? That your life would be hanging out with sinners? We hang out with people who don't know Jesus yet and I can't believe it. Guilt by association. And Jesus says this, when he heard it, He says this, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. And then he quotes the Old Testament to them. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You know what he said? I desire sacrifice, uh, Sabbath, religious rules. I desire mercy, not your religious rules. That's what he's trying to say. And he's trying to blow them all up and say, you've got to understand why God created these rules. It was for your flourishing, but now you're taking that very thing and you're keeping out the very people I want in. Paul says it this way, 1 Corinthians 3. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit kills gives life. The letter, the religious letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Let me uh, read you a story. Uh, Philip Yancey tells this story and what's so amazing about grace because here's the answer to legalism. Grace. That you and I would understand the concept of undeserved favor and go through the parables almost, you know, how many of them are about The ones you thought were on the inside are actually on the outside. The ones you thought were on the outside are actually on the inside. Parables like Matthew 20, where the mathematics of grace get decided, where it's like the guy who shows up at 8 a.m. gets the same payment as the guy who shows up at 4 p.m. because God's grace is undeserved. It's not based on your works. It's based on Jesus' works for you. Imagine becoming the kind of people. Now, uh, I'm going to read this story that's told uh, from Tony Campolo back in the day. It's a pretty famous story. Some of you might have heard it. Some of you might not. But it's a great illustration of what we're talking about. So this will take a couple minutes to sit back and and listen to this. Uh, Campolo tells about being invited to speak in Honolulu one time and having trouble getting his body to adjust to the 10-hour shift from his home in Philadelphia. He wound up wide awake at 3 in the morning drinking coffee in an all-night diner. Presently, the door opened and in came about eight women laughing and talking loudly. Campolo soon deduced that they were streetwalkers finished with their evening's work and relaxing before going home to sleep. They're prostitutes. One named Agnes mentioned to her friend that the next day would be her 39th birthday. After the group left, Campolo got a bright idea. He said to the gruff proprietor behind the counter, do you hear that one woman say tomorrow was her birthday? What do you say we throw, now listen, as even, I'm just looking at my own life. Like, what would I do? I'd be like, oh my goodness, I've got prostitutes here. This is like, oh, okay, I gotta get out of here. Like, I would feel like there's this moral culpability on me. But here's what he does. This is fascinating. What do you say we throw her a party? I'll come back tomorrow night with some decorations. Let's surprise her with cake and everything. The man's wife came out of the kitchen. Both of them said, this is a wonderful idea. Let's do it. 24 hours later, the little diner was decorated with streamers and balloons. A festive sign was taped up to the mirror. The couple had put the word out on the street and a large assortment of night people were gathered. When the prostitutes came in for their usual coffee, the shout went up, happy birthday, Agnes. The woman stood speechless as the singing began. Tears started to roll down her cheeks. Nobody had showed her genuine kindness in years. The owner brought out a birthday cake with candles. Agnes was in such shock that she had to be reminded to blow them out. She paused again. Well, cut the cake, Agnes, the shop owner said. She finally found the words. In a whisper, she said, please, I just want to keep the cake. I'll take it to my apartment down the street just for a couple days, but please let me keep the cake. No one knew how to respond, but no one could think of a reason to refuse her request. So out the door she fled, holding the cake as if it were the Holy Grail. An awkward silence filled the room. Campolo finally broke in with a bold question, a bold suggestion. I have another idea. Why don't we pray? Without hesitation, he began to pray a voice 
over the crowd for Agnes, that God would bless her on her birthday, that God would bring peace into her life and save her from all that troubled her. At the amen, the diner owner said, hey, you didn't tell me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you preach at? Campolo thought a moment, cocked his head sideways, and then answered with a grin, I preach at the kind of church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning. What happened next was the most poignant moment of all. The man squinted at Campolo and announced, no, no, you don't. There is no church like that. I would join a church like that. Are we a church like that? Are you a people like that? Are you an individual like that? I'm not sure without some training in grace, We are those people because you're meeting someone where they're at and this is the person who needs to be shown the grace and the love, but we want to lead with morality. In order to become a Christian, you need to do this and become this. It's almost like we think that Christianity is for conservative family-oriented culture that, you know, the, the, the Canada was birthed out of Christian laws crowd. And it's like, yeah, it is for that crowd, but it's also for the crowd that doesn't believe that and doesn't care about that. Because it's a beautiful gospel that's not trying to make people into some political ideological version of a Canadian or America, wherever you are. It's to come to know Christ and to come to know Christ by grace and understanding your own sin. That's why Jesus tells parables. It's the people who've been forgiven much that understand much. And their worship is like different. It's just like deeper. So think about your relational circles. Are you people who actually run with the people who need the grace or people who've already experienced the grace? That's what we're talking about. Because when you start to run with the people who need the grace, you know what happens? Your your black and white theology that looks so simple before, it gets messed with a bit. But you're not keeping the Sabbath, I know. I'm Jesus. And I'm coming to mess up the paradigms a little bit. I don't necessarily hang out with people who believe what I believe, look like I look, dress like I dress, listen to what I listen to, read what I read, and that's the point. I'm not sure that's us. If I told you the lifestyle of some of the people, do you know, do you know some of the people who text me? There's only a, a small, I, I know so many of you and I love it. So many of you pray for me and my family every week. And honestly, we'd be nowhere without it. But some of the people that I actually know that text me and let me know that they're praying for me and, and literally give me long prayers like this, these are people whose lifestyles, you would go, I'm not sure, I'm not sure God approves of that. And they pray for my kids by name. See, grace, the mathematics of grace are beautiful. And they start to mess with us a little bit. And so the story calls that out. I remember one, uh, one day I read the whole book of Romans in one sitting and someone asked me, what did you walk away with out of all this complex theology? I went through it and every time the word grace popped up, I circled it and, the, and, and Romans was a mess by the end because the big concept I walked away with was grace. I actually read Romans backwards as well. I read it forwards and then backwards. And I circled all the way, grace. The undeserved favor of God towards sinners who don't deserve it. That's the point. I read a story this week about a group of colleagues sitting at a big Christian conference and philosophers. And they were sitting in a room at Oxford years ago when C.S. Lewis was around. And uh, they were all, they all, the question got raised. It started to debate, what's the one unique idea that Christianity actually brought into the world? And everyone's like, well, is it justification? No. Is it, is it resurrection? No. Is it incarnate a re, uh, heaven after? No. Because this and this, this religion says this about resurrection and this re, uh, thing about this, about heaven and hell and all these different concepts. And they're all debating and Lewis walks in after half an hour. He's like, what's everyone talking about? And they're like, oh, they're trying to figure out what's the one idea that Christianity introduced to the world that's different than everything else. He goes, oh, that's easy. Grace. And they all sat there and looked and they all started to bathe. You're right. This is the concept. And so how is it that we're the ones who become so legalist in our version of reality that we miss the people who need the grace? Here's the beautiful thing. Christianity is not karma. It's not you do good things and God will love you. It's that he loved you already. And so here's Jesus starting to challenge that. Now, back to uh, verse 11. But he answered, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, well, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? 
for a moment before Jesus, before the, the story calls out the, uh, the, the other side of this ledger, right in the middle of it, it becomes a question of, of the identity of, of Jesus, Christology. Uh, who is this Jesus that healed you? And I just want to say, what's really important when we're reading the Bible is more than principles and ideas for your life, the Bible is about Jesus. It's about who he is and what he's done, more so and, and first before it's about you. So in your devotion time, when you're reading the Bible, yes, it's about you and what you're supposed to do with your finances and your dating life and whatever, but it's about Jesus. They go, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Who is this guy? And of course, we talked about uh, yesterday, now the man, or last, last week, now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. I love this. He doesn't know who healed him. He doesn't know who actually healed him. Remember last time we said there's this faith healer and uh, uh, the faith healer idea that only people who have a deep amount of faith get healed. This guy gets healed, doesn't even know who Jesus is. And here's what I love about this. Uh, it's this question of, do you recognize that the good things in your life come to you from Jesus? It's the question of authority. Like, are you the authority of your life? You, we tend to receive, there's a whole group of people watching this who receive the good things from Jesus, the healings, the health every morning when you wake up, the art, the sex, the music, the beauty in the world. You receive all those things, but you don't give credit to the fact, it's what theologians call common grace, that the rain and the sun are from God who gives them to you, whether you recognize it or not. But he gives them anyway, and that's how good he is. And so the question of this text is like, are you the authority in your own life that just whistles through life and you just think your vacation home and your vacations and your house and your air conditioning and whatever great things that have happened in your life, they're just from you. That's just what the universe gave you. This story goes, no, Jesus is behind those things, whether you recognize it or not. And so the question of the story is, are you willing to go, I'm gonna put myself in the place where I recognize Jesus is the authority. Jesus is the one who gives me those things or not. And those of you watching this, you're skeptics of that very question. You need to give your life to Jesus, like this guy finds out. Afterward, Jesus found him, verse 14, in the temple and said to him, see, you are well now. Here's, we already, you know, criticized the conservatives. Now we're gonna criticize the liberals. Here's what Jesus says. See, you are well. Love this. He's celebrating with them. Sin no more. See, he doesn't just let, kind of like the liberal ideology says, humankind's basically good. Any concept that says that people have sin, you know, that their nature is, 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 is at fault, that, that's wrong because we're only at fault because of our environment and human beings are basically good. And so if we can just educate them and do good economics and do good politics and do good education, then we can all work our way out and build a utopia, you know, build Babel, build the tower, build it all now. And we don't need God. And this concept of sin is bad. And don't worry about it. That's old school Christianity. And there's a stream that is kind of a progressive version of Christianity it goes, the Bible's not real. The resurrection is a metaphor. There's no such thing as sin. Don't worry about any sexual morality. You can just do what you want. It's licentiousness. Just, just run a hundred miles an hour toward whatever you want in life. Keep a vague concept of God and don't worry about all this old school, orthodox, traditional stuff about sin and hell and the wrath of God. That's not all real. And here, Jesus challenged the conservatives already by going, guys, Sabbath, legalism, not a thing. Now, but there is sin and I want you to stop it. Sin, no more. John Owen, the Puritan writer, talked about the idea, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. This is what we got to understand. He says that nothing worse may happen to you. Guys, there are worse things than dying. There is dying <clears throat> in our sin. There's dying having not been forgiven. If liberalism is right and there's no hell and 
heaven's for everybody and universalism and this is all metaphor and the Bible's just nice stories and narratives. I'm reading a book right now about all the missionaries that gave their life, their time, their energy, some of them, their actual lives to the mission that God gave them in the world. Hudson Taylor to China, Charles Finney, Adoniram Judson, Jim Elliott. How many can you go through? Revelation talks about the idea of the, the martyrs under the altar and that there's a number that God has in the world that are actually gonna be slaughtered for their faith. For what? Because the resurrection's a metaphor? Because there is no hell? Because the wrath of God isn't real? What are they giving their life and their time and their energy for? Their very lives on the line, dead in their 20s and 40s and 50s, men, women, children, for the cause of Christ in the world. It is all a joke if there's no such thing as sin. If all we need is a little tweak here and there, if all we need is a little advice about how to be a better person, what's the sin in your life that you're playing with? I read this week, we dare not laugh, even a cultural sin, we dare not laugh at sin that Jesus died for. I think we do though. Even in my, I'd laugh, you know, as long as I'm not doing it, it's funny. I laugh at it, it entertains me. I celebrate it. As long as it's a sin I'm not doing, how dare we laugh at things that make the heart of God break, that humankind is doing them, derailing us not only from him, but knowing God knows that the sin we do in our life is the stuff that actually gets, gets us off kilter with each other. Your social dynamics will be worse the more we don't trust the God of the universe to go, you know what? I'm gonna function this way, I'm gonna function this way. Versus I'm gonna take this into my own hands, become my own God, and I'm gonna do morality my way. I'm gonna make the decisions I wanna make. And Jesus goes, no, no. Licentiousness is wrong. Sin exists. And I actually not only want you to just acknowledge that sin exists, sin is literally uh, the word hamartia. Uh, it's to miss the mark. It's this idea of like a, um, uh, you have a bow and arrow and you're shooting at a target. I used to do that in, at summer camp. They used to put, you know, and I'd be looking at my friends and like shoot over at them and ah, you know, almost put the one through their eyeball. It's like, it's like you're doing that and you're missing the target. That's what sin is because the target is the righteous life God asks us to do. And of course, none of us can do it perfectly. That's what grace is. That's what the death of Jesus is. He's the one who comes and does it perfectly because we can't. And so all of that, he calls all of that out and he calls it out in you and me. Be killing sin in your life, guys, or sin will be killing you. I wanna free you, not only from the sin that's gonna entangle you and condemn you, it's actually, I wanna free you from the sin in your life, the present sin in your life, that's the point. And then he says this, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. And this was why the Jews are persecuting Jews because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them and he says this, and this is where it lands. My father, which we're gonna talk about Next week, this brilliant idea of Jesus' uh, relationship with the Father and, and our relationship with the Father and how that works is working until now and I am working. Why does he say that? Because what's the question on the table? Sabbath, where you're not supposed to work. And Jesus heals this guy. The controversy gets raised. He calls out the conservatives, he calls out the liberals. Then he lands the plane and he goes, guys, you're calling out this healing and you're trying to call me out. Here's what I'm gonna tell you. Don't you know that God, who you love and honor, has been working? Meaning he created the world. He rested on the seventh day. Sin entered the story and God and I, because there's a Trinitarian version of God in Christianity, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, began working on the redemption of the world. And I'm here now doing my part. You see this question of if you're allowed to work, he now roots it and answers them. Don't you know God's a worker? God is working miracles behind the scenes at every moment. This isn't the deistic God, the from a distance God. This is the God who created and, and, and continues to create beautiful realities in the world. And he's involved, he's meticulously sovereign over all things. And I am doing what the father does in the world. 
And this is this beautiful shift where we'll land it here where you, in your life, maybe you've never moved from a, a vague concept of God to the specific reality of Jesus Christ, the person and the work of Jesus. Some of you believe in God, but you've never given your life to Christ. You've never said, okay, what is this work that Jesus did? It's one thing to say, okay, the Father, maybe whatever concept I have of God, but Jesus in particular is working in his perfect life, death on the cross, atoning for sin, rising from death to give us new life that there's a group of people in the world who've said God's reality has broken into the world and we're living for it, even if people are gonna oppose us and put us on trial for it, which is what we're gonna see next week. He's working. He worked in his life, works in the cross, works in his resurrection, sends the spirit to those who repent of sin and give their life to him and say, I wanna now work in your power to see the people who need you come to know you. Is this work that you take on empowered by the God of the universe or not. He answers the question of whether they're allowed to work, not by going, don't worry guys, it's not the Sabbath. There's a new era in the Sabbath. He goes, God's working and I'm working. Are you going to revolve your heart and life around that or not? And that's the question of the time. And it sits there, the story sits there. The crowd, you and I have to now answer that question in particular. Are we willing to move from God to Jesus in particular? Specifically, not vague spirituality, as we all settle for, as we go through life. It's the question of Jesus himself and the cross and the scandal that creates in our life. So Father, I just pray for those who may not know you yet, who may not actually even have thought they'd ever become either the licentious person that runs a hundred miles an hour away from you or, or has you involved, but just runs toward whatever they're doing in life or the legalist person who runs toward the rules, but misses the spirit of the law. They never thought they'd become those people. And now this story exposes them both and calls both those hearts back to you, what you did on the cross, your work. Our work for you doesn't save us. Jesus' work for us saves us. And I pray if there's people right now that need to trust you, that they would do that right now. They would pray to repent of sin, give their life to you. And they'd let us know about it. They email us. They'd let us know, this is the decision I made today. And those of us who already know you, let us repent of either of those extremes let us actually believe in sin and let us l let go of the religion that oppresses and let us walk in that grace, that beautiful place where you are, where relationship is and that we would flourish to your glory so that the world may know. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen. 